when you're fortunate enough to have like Manowar or Tesla, something that you created, you know, in your garage many decades ago, and we're still doing it, you have to cherish it. When we broke up, I mean, it's pretty, pretty well documented. It was because of, you know, excess. Booze. Booze, drugs, drugs. all of it. The classic story, right? right? Everyone falls prey to it. You know, I mean, sure, when we all started, we all wanted to, you know, get chicks and drugs and everything else. Private and, jets, leather clothes, yeah, yeah, snakeskin boots. Shit. Listen, all that costs money. Someone's paying for it. And who's paying for it? You, the artist. Uh, I want to say that, first of all, thanks to everybody in South America. We were there in October. It was amazing. We had a wonderful time. We're looking forward to returning back. I'm back here in the studio. We're working on the new Man of War record. We're working on the re-recording of Sign of the Hammer. And we've been surprised today by the great opportunity to have somebody who is world famous. And for all the musicians out there, you know that we're doing this to try and help everybody who's getting started and also people who are established to learn a little bit more or just find out about people you like and admire. And we have somebody here who has more gold and platinum records than most people have hair on their wherever you want to look. Um, it's my honor and my pleasure today to have Brian Wheat uh, from Tesla here. And he's got a story, and it's a big story, and he's got a lot going on today in life, probably more than when he first started out. He's busier than hell doing so much stuff, and it's just a pleasure to welcome uh, a fellow bassist and a great one at that and a great guy, and I'm proud to say that he is also a dear friend. So Brian Wheat from Tesla, welcome. You're the man. No. <laughs> You're, don't be modest. Man. Uh, you're too kind. Well, that's not what most people say about me. Well, they say the same about so, me. Have so, have you ever met any assholes in this business? A few. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody few. needs an asshole. Yeah, yeah. A few. Phys physically, we, we need an asshole, but also I found that people in this business um, who need, in, in most of the time, it's either a manager or an agent or a promoter, mm -hmm. they don't want to take responsibility so they'll go yeah my, my manager did it man sorry about that he's an asshole when really they don't want to take responsibility themselves for for what goes on in their career now you managed tesla for quite a while right? yeah yeah i do i i started managing them in 2006 All right well i mean it depends on how you i started actually getting paid in 2006 but our original managers were Cliff Bernstein and Peter Mitch from Q Prime. And when we broke up in 96 uh, and put the back, band back together in, in 2000, they did not want to re-up. Re <laughs> they didn't, mm -hmm. you know, we were, we were a pain in the ass. Um, so at that point, we had to kind of take the bull by the horns and do it ourselves. So we had a few, a few managers and, and they meant well, but. They really weren't doing what I thought they should be doing because I was very, I paid a lot of attention to Peter and Cliff. And like, I was the guy that they kind of said, look, you're going to be the, the point guy and, you know, you'll deal with the band and we'll deal with you. And basically after trying a few, few managers who, you know, meant well, but basically weren't bringing anything new to the table and the brand was already created, you know, 10 years and all those gold and platinum records and stuff. I figured, well, I'll just do it, and no one's going to look after my career better than me, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the guys in my band, Frank and Jeff and, and Tommy and Troy at that time, um, were fine with it. So I've been doing it ever since then. Wow. And uh, out of necessity. Well, it's... it's but I enjoy it. I can't say that I don't enjoy but it. But that's something to be proud of, because, you know, it, it, when, when I talk this way, people don't really understand when I say everybody needs an asshole. And when he took over manager of the band, you don't have an asshole then. You, whenever something goes wrong... I'm the wrong, asshole now. That, well, that's right. When something goes right or goes wrong in the business, the person who's there, and in, in this the case with Man of War, you know, I'm the asshole. And somebody has to take the responsibility. And, you know, you're one of the few people that really understands what it's like to have to live by the decisions that are what's best for the band, yeah. but 
maybe not what other people think is best for them, whether it's financially mm. or otherwise. And I have so much respect for somebody mm. like yourself that that's flying solo. You've got the trust of the band. You do it. But, right. Every you know, every decision I make for 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 Tesla is always for the the best for the overall for the company. Right. I don't make my own personal decisions or, you know, what's best for Jeff or what's best for Frank. It's the whole. Right. Because that's what people come to see. So when you when you're fortunate enough to have like Manowar or Tesla, something that you created, you know, in your garage many decades ago and we're still doing it, you have to cherish it and treat it with respect and care and a lot of people, you know, they come in outsiders and they just look at it as a as a paycheck. Oh, I, you know, I could do this. Well, that doesn't work for me. You know, you're not going to just put this on autopilot. And if I have to tell you what to do, then you shouldn't be doing it. Well, you know, for people that don't, that don't understand what he's talking about, the management team that he was with are spectacular, by the way. It's... Uh... Peter mentioned Cliff Bernstein, and they're the people that coincidentally manage Metallica, among other groups. And they are the top of the line management company. They're, well, certainly one of them, and they've been around for a long time. They're great. But you guys got to a point in your career where you had a huge run of platinum records. And at that mm -hmm. point, for whatever reason, they didn't want to come on board. And that is the true test of a real artist. And for you people that are getting started, guys, girls, whoever you are, the purpose of this show is to hear these real life stories so that you can understand if you're in it, oh yeah, you have somebody to sympathize with. And if you're just getting started, you're considering getting into this business, it's important to understand that somebody that you trust, it must be yourself sometimes, has to make decisions and they have to live by that. And it's it's really difficult to do that. And weathering what I call the storm means getting dropped by a record company, getting dropped by a booking agent, getting dropped by a manager, and the band keeps going, you know, and there has to be a spark plug that says we're going to fire on all cylinders no matter what happened. So that is a big hurdle that, that you faced. And so when you, you started with the managers, let me guess, Everybody was there wanting to get involved because it was an easy 20% off the top, right? Yeah. But the work had already been done. All the work that had been done on that brand was done by us and Peter and Cliff and, and, and Tom Zutat at Geffen at that point. And, you know, we were difficult. How there, so? How so well, difficult? Well, I mean, we're young. And listen, our first record was a multi-platinum record. We had six platinum records in a row. How old were you when, when that first platinum 22. record? 22. Right. So, you know, when you're 22 and all of a sudden you got, you know, everyone telling you how cool you are and you got these platinum, you start to believe the bullshit and the hype. And we're human, so we, we bought into it and believed it. And I tell people the best thing that happened to us was us breaking up. Because when we broke up, I mean, it's pretty pretty well documented it was because of you know excess booze booze drugs, drugs all of it the classic story right? right everyone falls prey to it people who were all your friends hanging oh, around yeah, 20 yeah. 30 up. so you break up and then you're yesterday's news and and then all of a sudden it's just you no mm -hmm. one no one cares because you know okay tesla's broke up hey i got brian brian weed i got a new band called somewhat are you interested no you know what I mean? Oh, okay. What, you call another guy? No, no. So, you know, my goal then was to to get my new band a record deal, and I did, right? And then, you know, Tesla gets back together, and then all of a sudden, oh, hey, how you been? I was okay. meaning to call you. Yeah, hey, man, are you looking for... So, but the first guys I called were Peter and Cliff, and they said, you know, look, you know, we had a great run, and we're just too busy. And, and, and Cliff actually helped us. A and R the first couple of records when we got back together, but he just didn't have time to do it. And at that point, it was like so you had a you you had a couple other guys that you thought, well, I have to have a manager, right? Because that's what people do. And um, so you you put someone on there, and you see all these things getting dropped, and that they're just basically taking a commission. But you know, so it, it was like, well, we'll just do it ourselves. So I said this in my book, and 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 it, I think it pissed off one of my my friends um, and one of our first producers, Steve Thompson, because he probably read the book and 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 you know that does just reads it how it looks and not what I meant by it. But I said I'm more proud of the second part of our career than the first part. 
being from 2000 to now, which is 23 years, because we've done all that on our own, right? The first 10 years, we had Geffen Records, we had Q Prime, we had the big, you know, David Geffen machine, all that stuff, right? Then it's like, okay, and then that blew up, right? And we saw all these records, and then we burn out, and and then when we got back together, no one wanted to, all of a sudden, you know, you call the producers and say, hey, we're getting back together. You want to do, do another record? And they're like, well, it depends if the songs are any good. I heard that. Oh, that used to piss me up. <laughs> what the fuck you mean it depends if it's, weren't the songs good on the first five platinum records you did? The first 500 million records sold? Right. Well, it wasn't that, but. Well, but, you know what I'm trying to say. But yeah, the big so picture, it's like, come on, what's the okay, difference? well, what do you mean if the songs weren't good? What, they weren't good? So it's like, you know, fuck off. You know, if the songs are any good. And I heard that. That that used to just fucking piss me off. Oh, yeah. So we just did everything on our own. And then we put out a, a, a record. And we did 200,000 records in 2004, which no one was doing from our time period on our own. And like, oh, wow. And, you know, we go out and we play. We're still playing 23 years later. You know, 3,000 people a night in pretty much any market in America. And we do all that on our own. I mean, we have a great agent that we've had since day one, Adam Kornfeld. And he's Metallica's agent as yeah, well. Yeah, and and Leopards and, you know, mm -hmm. all the Q Prime family mm -hmm. is all still, you know, still family to us. Mm -hmm. And I have the most respect for Peter and Cliff, but I measure everyone against Peter and Cliff. Mm -hmm. And everyone that managed us since Peter and Cliff did not live up to that. The only one that does, I will say humbly, is me well, but, but because you, I know you had a good what, school. You had a, you went to a good school. I went to guys. yeah. I, went, I studied with the the, the professors, yeah. right? And it's they taught me what it was, and uh, so we just I do it myself, you know. And the band trusts me that I don't fuck it up, and they're happy. I mean, we do better. You said earlier, I'm busier today than I was then. We do better now, financially and everything. Than we did when we were selling, you know, two million records and you know twelve thousand tickets a night in arenas. Well, so go the, the, figure, the right? Well, there's the accounting factor that right, goes into well, it, the right? accounting and how many people are taking a piece of the pie and and I mean, no one ever ripped us off. I can say that, like, no one ripped us off. Our managers didn't rip us off. Our business managers never ripped us off. But we were splitting up the pie a lot of ways. And we were, you know, we were doing things to excess. I mean, you know, listen, the cocaine budget on, on one song was $60,000. It's insane. Ten songs on the record? That's only 600 grand. I mean, but, you know, I mean, it's like we didn't pay attention. You know, you pay for everything. Everything we do, we pay for. So at the end of the day, who are the last guys to get paid? Brian, Frank, Jeff, you know. And that's the other thing. That's a really good point. This is what people need to hear because this is an important point. I want to thank you for bringing it up. The band feeds everybody. And I think all musicians should know that. The band feeds everybody in the line. So you've got a crew. They depend on the band for their for their income. You've got people who are renting theaters or venues or club owners without a band, you know, okay, they're going to have a DJ. And then you've got the other people, agents, managers, record companies. There would be no need for any of these people if it wasn't the band. And all of those expenses, when people say the ticket prices are high, there is no other choice because there's so much little money left after all the expenses are taken out for the band to even eat. And I think a lot of people don't understand how enormous it is, particularly now after COVID trying to tour the cost of trucking, busing, lighting oh, yeah, sound, it's through the up. roof. And, you know, the bands have very little control over that. And certainly if we could control the expenses, I think most people would try to minimize expenses wherever you can, but you can't fight the price of gas. I mean, it is what well, it is. I mean, listen, you know, that it, that's so, that topic is so deep because it gets just gets into the the economy of the world it is what it is I mean, but for guys sitting in their bedroom right now looking at you a guy yeah. who is a success who made himself a success the first part was quote unquote to people easy you had the monster machine you mm -hmm. had the monster manager you had the monster yeah. agent hey man fantastic but after that when all those people go away for whatever reason and they do and they will go away believe it no oh, matter yeah. what you sell 
you're going to be on your own. And it's up to you now to educate yourself about what's going to happen after the glory's gone and the big money and how do you survive. And I want to lead into the next part of the okay. segment, which is, you know, you're a lyric writer, a music writer, you're a singer, you're a producer, you're a recording engineer, you have your own studio and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Mm -hmm. You know, you're doing everything. You're even managing people. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. I heard you on the phone talking to somebody and I was really impressed because you didn't, you didn't lay out any bullshit. You just asked the person, what is your hope? What is your dream? And what's the reality and how do you intend to achieve it? And are you mm -hmm. able to finance it? And you were upfront about that, and that mm -hmm. just really impressed the hell out of me. Well, because I, 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 you know, there's a lot of people that just feed people that don't know any better a bunch of bullshit. You mean young artists that don't have a clue? Yeah, yeah. So you get these guys that just feed them a bunch of bullshit, and it's like, you know, like with the bands I manage and the people I work with outside of Tesla, it's like I got a job. I don't need to take your money. I'm not doing this for, because I want your money. I'm doing it because I, I have passion and I like to win. I like to take something from here and bring it to here. And whether it's a young band or whatever it is, but there's reality. You know, there's the reality of this business and it is a business. You know, I mean, sure, when we all started, we all wanted to, you know, get chicks and drugs and everything else. Private and, jets, leather clothes, yeah, yeah, snakeskin boots. Shit. Listen, all that costs money. Someone's paying for it. And who's paying for it? You, the artist. You're the last guy to get paid and you pay for it. So I don't bullshit anybody. It's like, look, you know, some guy calls me and he's 50 years old and he says, hey, I want to make a record. And I'm like, okay, you do realize, you know, what this is, okay? Okay, so you're going to, no one's going to give you $300,000 to make a record. You know, no record company is going to give you 50 years old, right? They don't even give it to 20-year-old kids in a van anymore. Those kids have to do everything on their own now. Where when we started, you didn't have to. We got signed on demo tapes, right? Today, if you want to get signed by a major label, you've got to, you know, have you know, a dozen markets that you're playing, that you're selling a thousand tickets on your own. You've got to have all this social media presence. You've got to have radio play. Then they'll do it and they'll give you pennies on the dollar and you've done all the work. Well, that model's done and tired. It's old. It don't work anymore. So where I can offer something to some people is like, look, I know the old school. But this is the new school. So if you have a budget and you want to do this and you really want to take a shot, I'll put together a radio team for you. I'll put get together a promotion team for you. This, that, and that. And this is record what it, people in your own record studio. Record people. You want to make a record? You don't have to spend. You know, have some producer that that's milking you for four thousand dollars a day. You know, you can go to a place for eight hundred dollars a day and do the same work. But people think, well, if you put this person with that name. You know, I can just buy this. Instant success? No, but no. But the thing that people don't realize is what we did in the garage, right? Or when we first started, we wanted to be musicians. We honed our craft. We learned how to play our instruments. We learned how to write songs. We learned how to make records. That just doesn't come, you know, you can't just buy that. That's a forgotten art. No, no. And, 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 and now with this AI stuff, you know, it's like, you know, come on. You know, you it, know, it's it's like uh, it, it, I feel bad for for people in in the music business today. starting out today. Today, yeah, I mean, I, if I had a son, I wouldn't want him to be a musician. Well, my parents didn't want me to be a musician. You know, I mean, I mean, back when I started, or back when you started, I mean, we had a a small chance to make it. Now that's like a what do you call it? microscopic, minuscule, microscopic. Minuscule. Yeah, I mean, today. I mean, it's really, really tough. And, and, you know, people aren't buying music anymore. They're streaming it. We're getting raped. Oh, my God. I looked at our streaming numbers today, Ugh. and it's like, oh, you're up 50% here. You're doing this. I'm yeah. like, oh, great. That means, you know, 500 million streams. I guess we're going to make $28. Yeah. You know? And because that, if you add 500 million streams, but let's say, so that stream, let's just say it equates to someone listening to your song. Right? They listen to it. On the family plan? Well, whatever it is, right? <laughs> when we were on radio, if we had one play on the radio station, 
We got four cents. Right. Right? Now, for one play, you get a one two hundred millionth of a cent. Yeah. Right? But yeah. people are still listening to it. So we're getting raped badly. And no one wants to say anything about it or do anything about it. It's just like, well, this is the new way. So the record companies are involved, and then you have Spotify, and, you know, listen, for the huge, huge artists, the Led Zeppelins and the Beatles and, and all that stuff, they're getting paid better than you or I are of getting paid. Or the kid that's, you know, just starting out at Active Rock, you know, and he's got one song. But when Modern Day Cowboy came out, we had all this airplay. We got played. There was... A fair wage. Now you don't, and then people aren't buying your record, so you're not you're not getting that buck a record that you used to get for selling it, because no one's buying it, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, vinyl sales are up. Yeah, great, but there no one's selling those kind of records. I mean, unless you're Taylor Swift or Miley Cyrus or something. But I mean, you know, a rock record selling 150 thousand copies physically is miraculous. Oh, for sure. You know, I mean. There's maybe three artists that can do that. Well, in two, and I think it was in the year 2000, I started a record label because I wanted to mm -hmm. give some people the opportunities that I never had. I wanted mm -hmm. somebody to make a record and have somebody who made records, who toured, who had all this experience, mm -hmm. try to sympathize with what they're trying to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. And this was this was my altruistic nature, believing mm -hmm. that the same kind of passion and love I put into trying to develop myself as a musician would hopefully inspire um, and help new people mm -hmm. get involved in the business. And I calculated back then that it would have to be some type of 360 arrangement so that any money I put out, and mm -hmm. believe me, I, you know, I'm not a bank. Mm -hmm. I had a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. I, I put out really very generous advances to these bands mm -hmm. uh, with the belief that they understood that you reciprocate by hard work, nothing else, because that's what it is. The band can only contribute their talent and their work and their right. heart and soul and blood. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to believe that they would work and act the way I did and believed and just mm -hmm. you're all, you don't sleep, you don't sleep, you don't eat, you don't eat, you don't have some luscious apartment and mm -hmm. you know, right, big car. Right. That's, that's life. That's the way it is. That's the mm -hmm. road, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was disconcerting for me to hear people go 360 deal what are you talking about i'm like look all i want is my money back my investment i don't want interest i just want my money back that i put out after that let's just split a, a fair split we'll talk mm -hmm. about it when the time comes mm -hmm. i mean what are we splitting ten dollars or ten million we should be so lucky mm -hmm. we, you know we have to talk about it and it it just didn't work out. I found that, mm. and I'm not trying to say it's a generational thing. I'm just saying well, to find people it is a who, who go thing, the distance and keep going. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you, you did know, it. Yeah, but we we're we're different. We're cut from a different cloth. That's what I was talking about. Our guitarist Mike Mike Badio the other day. I'm like, he was saying to me, "Well, yeah, I just I did this tour a while ago, and and they paid me real well." I said, "They didn't pay you. You paid them." What, what were they going to sell if you didn't get on that stage with that double neck guitar in mm -hmm. your 60 years of playing mm -hmm. and your ambidextrous, you know, gifts and all the stuff you do? You're selling those tickets, not them. Could they get on the stage right. and bring that money in? Yeah. You paid them, every one of them, you know, yeah. and, uh, and that's weathering the storm.